Grace be to God. Can you hear me clearly back there? Yeah, yeah, I need some help, okay? Well, praise be to God once again as we come before the Lord. As we've heard the different readings today, I believe the Lord is telling us that to follow the Lord effectively, we must consider His kingdom purposes worthy of our commitment and priority. To follow the Lord effectively, we must consider His kingdom purposes worthy of our commitment and priority. Okay? We've often talked about following the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, we, we've gone through the Holy Scriptures. We found out that Jesus is not looking for fans. Okay? He's, he's looking for followers. And a follower basically is a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not just following the Lord just for the blessings, for the benefits of him give. But a follower or a disciple is someone who wants to make a contribution to the kingdom of God. In other words, he just doesn't want to take from the kingdom of God what is good for him. But a follower or a disciple wants to be able to give back to the kingdom of God. A follower says, Lord, I thank you that you've saved me. Help me now to bring others to salvation. Thank you, Lord, that you've healed me. Help me to bring healing to others. Thank you, Lord, you've delivered me. Help me to bring deliverance to others. Thank you, Lord, you've provided for my needs. Now, Lord, I also would like to be of help in providing somebody's needs. So a disciple is not just self-centered or he's thinking about himself. A disciple is following the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to be just like Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? Okay? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Okay. All right, but to follow the Lord effectively, we must consider His kingdom purposes or the assignments or the mission that God has given us as worthy of our commitment. In other words, is His cause, is His mission, is the thing that the Lord wanted me to do worthy of my full com commitment? Is it to die for? You understand what I'm saying? Am I willing to abandon everything just so that I can fulfill what God wants me to do? That's commitment, okay? But at the same time, we must begin to see that it is worthy of our time, worthy of our time. That means we must consider it more important than the whole, all the other things in our lives. Now understand that every time we come to the, to the altar of God in the beginning, we hear the words, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Amen. But we've gone through different scriptures and we found out the Lord is saying, we must love him more than we love our own lives. We must love him more than we love our own families. The Lord doesn't say we were not to love our families. The Lord is saying, yes, love our families, but our love for him must be greater than our love for our families. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we must consider the mission that God has given us, the calling that God has given us, uh, the purposes of God in our lives, more important than anything else. And it is worthy of our commitment to Him. Now, let's look at some of the things that we see here. Two things I'd like to share with you based on this particular scripture. The first one I'm basing this on verse 51 to 56. It's this. We must be committed to follow God and His purposes. We must be committed to follow God and His purposes. We must be committed to follow God and His purposes. Okay, second thought I'd like to share with you. I'm basing this at verse 57 to 62. We cannot be half-hearted in serving the Lord. We cannot be half-hearted in serving the Lord. Okay? Now basically, let's go back. Let's go back. 
to ver uh, our first principle, verse 51 to 56. We must be committed to follow God and His purposes. When we say we are committed to something or someone, that means we kind of tie ourselves to that person. Uh, we heard the reading, uh, the first reading, how that Elijah uh, called Elisha to follow him. At the moment when Elijah called Elisha, Elisha was plowing, okay? He owned his own plow, and he owned his own boats. These were investments during that particular time. But when God called him uh, through Elijah, what Elisha did was, he butchered his own wolves, gave it to his neighbors, and then he offered it to God, and then he used his plow. They became firewood. In other words, he was cutting off everything that would make him go back. In other words, he's saying, Elijah, I am responding to the call of God. Never again will I think to go back to my old way of life. If things become difficult, I'm not thinking of quitting and going back. If things become hard and painful, I'm not thinking of quitting and going back. I am in this, all of me, all in. You understand what I'm saying? This is what Elijah was saying. I am in this, my heart, my soul, my spirit. I am answering the call of God. Sing or swim. This is what I'm going to devote my life to. Basically, that's that's commitment. Okay? It's something that you are called to do. How many of you here are married? Some of you are married, you don't want to raise your hand, that would be you. Okay? When you get married, you commit to one person. Okay? You say, for better or for worse. Till death, do us part. Okay? I may not know your weakness. I may find out your weaknesses later. I might find out some of your irritating traits later. But you know what? I married you. I'm committed to you. You understand what I'm saying? Hello? Okay? So you're not thinking, you know, things getting hard. Things are getting difficult. Things are getting complicated. It's quitting time. No, that's not what you do. You are committed. You made the decision. You are in this forever. And if we want to be able to be effective in following God, in fulfilling the things that God has given us, we must be willing to make that commitment. It is going to be a leap of faith. It is going to be a commitment where you don't say to God, God, please show me first my rewards. Please show me first what I'm going to get out of this. Please show me first what I need to give up later on. No. It is by faith. You need to trust God completely. You need to understand that God's plans for you are greater, better, and nobler and higher than your best plans for yourself. Do you understand what I'm saying? You must be 100% in this to make it work. Amen? So we need to understand that when you get committed to the Lord's work, uh, that there is an enemy army that is opposing the kingdom of God at all times. And they concentrate their firepower against those who have committed themselves to the kingdom of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? Uh, and God is saying, I don't want you to step into this and then later on say, you know, when things are getting difficult and complicated and hard, oh, I didn't sign up for this. You see, when you said yes to God, you signed up for that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Hello? So we need to understand that, church. And uh, let me just read verse 51 here. Now it came to pass, the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. 
What does that mean? Uh, that means he made up his mind that I am going to go to Jerusalem and fulfill the will of God for me. Okay? What was going to happen to him to Jerusalem? He was going to be betrayed. He was going to be captured. He was going to be humiliated. He was going to be uh, 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 charged falsely. He was going to be tortured. He was going to be crucified on the cross. He was going to suffer the most painful death ever devised for mankind. Okay? This is not, you know, this is one part of his ministry that probably did not fill the Lord Jesus with joy. You understand what I'm saying? I, you know, when, when I see what Jesus Christ did, when he preached the kingdom of God to the people, I could imagine his joy. You know, when I was in Baba this, uh, uh, this, this week, I was teaching uh, uh, the churches there. There were some things that they didn't know. But when they heard the word of the Lord concerning certain things, I could see their eyes, their understanding just lighting up. I say, oh, that's it. And that fills me with joy. Okay? To help people understand the things of the kingdom of God. I'm sure when Jesus Christ laid hands on the sick and they were not when, when Jesus Christ was walking along and there was this uh, funeral procession coming the opposite side and he goes there and he sees this woman, his own, her only son had died, okay, and he commands this boy to, to stand up, to come back. He brings life to the dead. And when the woman saw that, probably she was rejoicing. Do you think Jesus Christ was filled with joy? Yes, he was. Amen? Or maybe when he, he was preaching and uh, the people got hungry, okay? And then uh, he took a few pieces of loaves, bread loaves and fish. He thanked, he thanked the Father. In moment by, he met the needs of the people there. Do you think this thing filled him with joy? Yes, it did. Jesus was someone who was praying to the Father continually. Okay? And he was seeing answers to prayers continually. Do you think that when Jesus saw answers to his prayers, that he was filled with joy? Yes, because he said, one day you're going to go to the Father and you're going to ask him in my name, then your joy will be made full. In other words, you're going to feed what I feed. What I'm saying is this, there are some things in the ministry that's nice to do. You know, uh, I like helping people. I like seeing people begin to understand the principles of God. I like seeing people receive the miracles. I like seeing people begin to walk in the principles of God, seeing their healing, seeing provisions of their lives. I, like, I mean, when, when, when people begin to see that God is a God who meets their needs, Fills me with joy, right? But there are also other parts of the ministry that's not as nice. You understand what I'm saying? Way back in 2013, I was called upon to do something that was not very joyful. Okay? I was called upon to confront somebody that I looked up to because of something that that person was doing in the body of Christ that was not good. Alright? I didn't want to do it. I struggled in thinking about it. I even came to the point 
of thinking, maybe if I were not a bishop, I wouldn't have to do this. Do you understand what I'm saying? I flirted with the thought, maybe I should just resign from being a bishop so that somebody else can do this. You understand what I'm saying? That was how hard it was for me. But then when I was thinking that everything I preached concerning not quitting came back to me. You understand what I'm saying? God was telling me, you are going to be held responsible for those words you taught them. Understand, in the book of James, it says there is greater accountability that is going to be required from teachers. You're a teacher, you taught the people that you cannot do that without penalty. You understand what I'm saying? Then he brought me to another part of the scripture in the book of Revelation, where it says that when the kingdom of God comes down, there are certain people who are not going to be able to enter into that. One of them were the cowards. Lord, I don't want to be a coward. Okay, Lord. I don't like doing this. But if this is something that I need to do, and the reason why I was so really annoyed at that time was that there were certain bishops who already knew what was going on before I found out. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, I only found out about this situation in 2013. There were some who already knew about what was going on as early as 2005. You understand what I'm saying? And I can't help but think, why me, Lord? I just found out these guys, they already knew. Okay? Why did it have to be me? Well, I didn't receive an answer there. All I knew was God tasked me with this job. So I did it. You understand what I'm saying? It was the most inconvenient, uncomfortable, unpleasurable, undesirable, and painful thing that I could have done. But Lord, I said, Lord, if this is something that you want me to do, I'll do it. You understand what I'm saying? See, you, you need to understand that ministry, there are going to be highs, you know? Uh, times where you're rejoicing because you get to do something that you love because you love the Lord, you get to do something that you love. Okay? But there are times in ministry when you get to do something really difficult, difficult and hard, and sometimes it's going to be downright painful. And that's where your commitment begins to kick in. When you don't want to do something, but because God was the one who was giving you the responsibility that you say, yes, Lord, I do it. You know what I'm saying? And you're pushing your body, you're pushing your soul, you're pushing your time to go do it. Because what you want to do is procrastinate. I'll do it tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow. You know, tomorrow never comes. You try not to do it. You say, Lord, I'll do it tomorrow. Right? But you always find something to do. Well, this is important. Lord, we have a seminar. After a seminar. So now it finishes. We got to do it. Well, Lord, we have this visitation. I got to do the visitation. And then when it's done, God said, well, Lord, I've got to do the visitation. You always find something to do just to avoid 
doing what God wants you to do, something that's unpleasant. And I don't know what it is. With some people. Do you understand what I'm saying? And this is Jesus in the beginning. He was setting his faith. He would, in other words, uh, I guess a modern phrase today is he put his game face on. Okay? It's so like, have you seen some of the early boxing days of Pacquiao when he was becoming big? Now being interviewed before the fight, he's smiling. And then when it comes to the fight, he puts his game face on. This is it, I'm going to fight, and I'm going to go for the game. And basically, that's what it means when it says that Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem. Okay? He's not going to go there to heal the sick. He's not going to go there to raise the dead. He's not going to go there to multiply loaves and fish. He's not going to go there to do uh, miracles that would benefit uh, some of the people at that particular time. What he's going to do will benefit all of us at, of all time. But for him to do that, he had to submit himself to the cruelty of man. Okay? They would put him in chains. They would, they would lacerate his back. They would torture him. They would make sure he doesn't sleep at night. They would, in his weakened condition, make him carry his cross. They would bring him to Calvary. They would prolong his death through the crucifixion of the cross. Okay? Until he dies. Okay? They would strip him of everything. He would be naked and exposed in front of his friends, in front of his apostles, in front of his own mother. You understand what I'm saying? Total humiliation. I don't see Jesus looking forward to this. I'm going to go through this. Yay! No. He wasn't looking. He wasn't feeling that way. He knew he had to do it. And so he set his gay face on. He set his face towards Jerusalem. And we need to understand that when it comes to the ministry, it's got to be like that for us, you know. I'll, I'll, I'll try to be involved, you know. Hopefully things doesn't get difficult. Hopefully things doesn't get uh, uh, painful, you know. But, but if things get hard, you know, I'll see if I can still be involved, you know. To be committed to God is to say, I don't care if things become complicated. I don't care if things get painful. I don't care if things get hard. I am in this 100%. I'm all in. Amen? So if we want to become affected as followers of the kingdom of God, you are entering into warfare. Because Satan knows those people who can build the kingdom of God and destroy what he has tried to place on the earth are people who are committed to God. 100%. He's going to turn up the heat. He's going to turn up the pressure. But if you say, Lord, I don't care what's going on, you will find that as you take steps of faith and commitment, the greater one will be assisted. You're not doing this alone. You are backed up by the prayers of the saints of all ages. You are backed up by the angels of God. You are backed up by the power of the Holy Spirit. You are backed up by the resources of heaven, by the very throne of God. Understand what I'm saying? Okay? Man, that's just the beginning verse. There's, it's so rich. Let's go on. Now it came to pass when he, time had come for him to be received of, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. In other words, before he was received up, before he ascended to heaven, he was committed, he had this, he was resolute, I'm going to do this. You need to understand, okay, that just as Jesus was committed to fulfilling his mission before he ascended to heaven, so this Jesus 
is committed to coming back again. You understand what I'm saying? Okay? And it says here in the Holy Scriptures, in verse 52, and he sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare for it. This brings us to mind, this brings to mind that part in the book of Malachi where it says he sends first his messengers to prepare his place for him. In the beginning, this was St. John the Baptist. Right? Hello? But St. John the Baptist had already died by this time. Okay, his head was chopped off. But you know what? The Lord is saying that he's still sending messengers before his face. Before he comes back again, he is relying on his messengers. And unlike John the Baptist, who was named in the beginning, these messengers are just called messengers. Okay? There are no names here. Why? Because this is open to the church. Whoever will answer the call of God to do his work before he comes. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? This is now our job. This is now a rule that has opened up to us. John the Baptist vacated this when he left the earth. We're still in the earth, and Jesus is only coming back to the earth. If I'm reading the signs of the times of right, okay, and if I, you know, with, with the different things, I, I'm taking the Jewish time, I'm taking the Jewish fees, the signs, the, the blood rules, okay, I'm looking at what's going on in the world. You know, I'm trying to correlate them all together. His return is not far. Very near. As a matter of fact, the daughter of Billy Graham, Billy Graham is an evangelist. He's, oh, I think he's in his 90s, I'm not sure. But his daughter, was born in 1948. It was the year that Israel became a state. So, you know, she's also not young also. She's a senior citizen also. And while she was preaching, she said, I believe I will see the return of Jesus Christ in my life. I'm younger than her. You understand what I'm saying? If she believes that Christ will come, I mean, she, she just gave a talk on what's going on, and why she believes that. Okay, I'm not saying she's wrong, I'm not saying she's right. But there is that. Okay? And the Lord is definitely committed uh, in his coming back. And he's still sending messengers before his face. The name messengers has no name, just unlike John the Baptist, when John the Baptist was named. Why? Because this is an open invitation to become one of his messengers. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen? You need to understand this, church. Now let's go on. So they went and entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare for him, but they did not receive him, because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. Okay? Samaria did not receive him. Why is this? What, what, what's this conflict between the Samaritans and the Jews? Well, there was a time when Israel, uh, Jerusalem, they were violating the commandments of God. And one of the things that happens when you violate the commandments of God, you lose your benefits, you lose your protection. Okay? And what happened was their enemy, the Assyrians, began to win the war. They dominated. And at one point in time, they took the Jews captive, brought them back to wherever they are. 
And uh, you will find a story in 2 Kings, uh, chapter 17, verse 24 to 29. Okay? So what happened? They planted foreigners there. They left a few Jews in there. And there was intermarriage. Okay? And not only that, there was the introduction of pagan worship. Okay? Now some of the Jews there wanted to worship the one true God. So the king of Assyria sent a priest who would teach them the things of God. The thing was, there was the worship of God, but at the same time, there were people who, together with worshiping God, they were worshiping other gods. They had a mixed kind of faith. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, in other words, uh, the blood was contaminated. It was not purely Jewish blood. And their worship was also contaminated because along with the worship of the one true God, they had uh, adopted some worship forms that belonged to other gods. And so the Jews, they regarded Jewish Samaritans as unclean or impure. Okay? One day, Zerubbabel the prophet prophesied that the second temple would be rebuilt. And when he started leading the Jews from their exile in rebuilding the second temple, the Jews from Samaria said, we'd like to help. We'd like to become part of this revival. And Zerubbabel and the other Jews said, no, you're not clean. You're not pure. You are not worthy to build the second temple. And so because of that, they built a rival temple in Mount Gerizim. And so what I'm saying? So they had these two temples rivaling each other. And this matter did not like the Jews very much. And the Jews did not like the Jews very much. The nice thing about this was when Jesus Christ went out to the right hand of the Father, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he told the apostles, the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will become witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the rest of the world. You understand what I'm saying? That's the reason why they were fighting, because the Samaritans were impure. Now, when I was thinking about this, I felt that the Spirit of God is saying this to also. As the day of the Lord's return approaches, God is going to call forth for a much more committed lifestyle from His church. Okay? All or nothing. However, there will be other Christians who because they accept certain parts of the world's philosophy. Who because they accept, you know, they have mixed beliefs. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, there are Christians today, they are believing that God will supply their needs, but then in their home they have these little idols that are supposed to bring prosperity to their house. You know, one is a really fat guy who doesn't have any hair, and another one is a frog who has a point in his mouth. And so what I'm saying? They still believe that when New Year comes along, you have to wear polka dots so that money will come in. God doesn't need polka dot clothes for, you, for money to come in. God just needs your obedience to your faith in him. It's not Jesus Christ plus something else. It's Jesus Christ alone. God alone. You understand what I'm saying? There will be other Christians who believe in other things. For example, there are Christians today who believe it's possible to be a Christian and still be gay and not repent of that lifestyle. They believe that they can marry same-sex marriages. They can marry someone of the same sex, and they can become ministers who are able to do those kinds of marriage. And they say, well, you know, God is love, and so we believe this is possible. They have mixed faith. 
Okay? It's mixed with something else. But that's not the word of God. And the thing, the sad thing is, when when the real Christians rise up and they want to do what God wants to do, yes, they will meet opposition from the world, but they will also meet some persecution from other Christians who have a big system of belief. Do you understand what I'm saying? There will be blood on the altar because of Samaritan kind of life of Christians who believe in Christ's teachings plus the philosophies of the world. Do you understand what I'm saying? I know that there are Christians today who have an extreme view of, of, of grace. They believe that because of the grace of God, there's no longer such a thing as sin in their lives. So if they get, do something that is considered sin, it's okay. There's some Christians who believe there's no more hell. And so they can do anything that they want because they're free to do it because there's no more hell. You understand what I'm saying? And then there are Christians who believe that they can get married in the same sense. Cannot be. And they argue well. But, well isn't God the God of love? Yes, He is. But God is not just a God of love, God is also a God of righteousness, justice. Remember, the foundation of His throne is righteousness. Mercy goes before him, but the foundation of his throne is righteousness. You take away righteousness, his throne cannot stand. God is not exchanging love for righteousness. They're all there. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen? We need to see this church. And I pray that when these things happen, that we will not be one of the Samaritans, right? That we will be those who would worship the Lord our God purely. And if other Christians come against us because they think we're fanatics, that we will love and forgive them in return and pray for them. Amen? You need to see this church. Okay, let's go on. They did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. In other words, Jesus Christ saying, I'm here, and because I'm here, the grace of saving others is here. The time of judgment will come, but not today. Okay? During this time, everyone, because of the love of God, is given a chance to be reconciled with God the Father. God the Father, not the Father. God the Father. You understand what I'm saying? Through Jesus Christ. If we've run away from Christ, and we've strayed away from this is the time to come back. Now is the day of the consolation. Okay? And start living the life that God has given to us. Because He is a God of love who made mistakes. We can say, Lord, I'm sorry. Can you help me again? And He will. But one day when Jesus Christ comes, that will be the end of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. When He comes, the judgment will come. If you've not made our peace with God, and Jesus Christ come, and then it's going to be too late. That's not what I'm saying. Amen? So he's, he's saying, the time for destroying lives is not now. I'm here to save life. I'm here to get as many people into heaven as possible. I'm here not just for the Jews. I'm not here not just for the holy guys. I'm here for the other guys. He said, Make sure you preach the gospel to Samaria, and then after that to the rest of the world. Do you understand what I'm saying? We are grateful to God. We are in an age of grace. Okay? 
But we must receive that grace in our lives. Because if we don't, and we have not received that grace, it will be too late. We understand what I'm saying. I heard one preacher, while he was preaching, he was a young kid. He's 13 years old. And he's preaching about the grace of God and about heaven. And then somebody from the crowd said to him, What are you going to do, boy, if you die and you find out there is no heaven? This preacher looked at him and said, Well, what are you going to do if you die and you find out there is a hell? Where do you say? Shut Must be the Holy Spirit working in his life. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? All right, let's go to the second thought. I'll, I'll go through this quickly. First, 57 to 62. We cannot be half-hearted in serving the Lord. Okay. Now it happened as they journeyed uh, on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes are bold, birds of the air have heads. For the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, you need to understand, if you're looking for convenience, if you're looking for comfort, looking for recognition, uh, those are the wrong reasons why you want to follow me. Okay? In other words, you might be looking for a return. And Jesus Christ is saying, even if there is no return, you must be willing to follow me. You must consider it so important that if you don't get anything back, you must be willing to follow me. Now we know it gets out of bad disease and out of waters. But if this guy had some other things in his heart, another agenda, what he can get, he's telling him, he's telling him, that's not the reason why you follow me. You need to follow me even if it means it cancels your vacation. You need to follow me even if it means you have to give up everything. Okay? And then another said to him, then he said to another, follow me. But, but he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. He was not asking this person to disrespect his father. But during that time, when you say something like, let me go first bury my father, it doesn't mean your father's dead. Okay? It simply means he's alive, and then you wait until he's old, and then dies, and then now you get to bury him. And Jesus Christ was saying, if you want to follow me, you cannot delay this. You cannot say other things first. Okay? You want to follow me, you need to consider it more important than the other things. Follow me now. You understand what I'm saying? Hello? Okay? And then another also said, Lord, I will follow you. But let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, he saw this man's motivation. He wanted to follow the Lord, but he was apprehensive. He was afraid that he might not be able to uh, let go of other things, or if he might let go of other things, he might want them back. You know, he was always, let me, let me first go to my house and take it over. And Jesus kept saying, that if you want to follow me, the only direction you are to look forward to is forward. You cannot look back. You cannot think, well, uh, did I act too soon? Or, you know, was there something I needed to go back? Let, let me first go back and see if, you know, I, I might miss this thing. And Jesus Christ said, if you follow me, you must consider me more important than anything else. And when you choose to follow me, there's no looking back anymore. You understand what I'm saying? Um, I understand some people say, well, you know, I have this and I have that. I have my business to tend to. I have my dreams to fulfill. I, you know, I've got to do a lot. People to see places to go, things to do. I understand. Let me tell you about the story of this African woman, I read a long time ago. She, she's in Africa and, and they wanted to build a church there, except that they don't have any money. 
and uh, if she sold her possession, new possession, they were not allowed to have it. So, at that time, she went to someone. See, they, they, they still, at that time, practiced slavery. She sold herself as a slave forever. Get that? She sold herself as a lifetime slave for forty dollars, so she could get, so she could have forty dollars to give to the building contractors. She considered having. Days of worship so important to her, her family, and her daughters. But she decided, I'm going to sell my freedom. I will be a slave forever for $40 so I can give $40 for the building of the church. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, compare that to whatever excuses you have. We need to be effective in the kingdom of God. But we must be all in. We must be committed to it. It must be the most important thing in our lives. Jesus modeled the lifestyle for us. All we have to do is follow the Lord. Amen. How many of you learned something today? Praise God, it's all standing.